Now we will be going back to the commitments of the Paris Climate Agreement and explore the energy transition required to make these commitments a reality. The important question is, of course, what does the Paris Agreement mean for the energy system? As we have seen, limiting temperature increase to well below 2 degrees C or 1.5 degrees C requires net zero emissions by 2050 or soon thereafter. A typical emission scenario now looks as follows. First of all, let's look at the energy emissions here indicated in grey. They must be reduced quite quickly to near zero by the middle of the century or a little bit beyond that. But of course, there are other CO2 emissions as we already indicated. Most of them are from land use change. To meet our targets, these also typically need to go to zero. What we see, however, is that going to zero is not enough. We must move to negative emissions. But how is that possible? Basically, there are two ways to do that. Firstly, to turn the biosphere, which is now a net source of CO2 emissions, into a sink for CO2. So where deforestation leads to CO2 emissions, reforestation and afforestation lead to the extraction of CO2 from the atmosphere. That's what you see here in orange. In addition to that, there are also all kinds of other possibilities which involve recovering CO2 from the atmosphere, shown in yellow. For example, the use of bioenergy as an energy source and the capture of the resulting CO2 leading to the net removal of CO2 from the atmosphere. It is also possible to directly capture CO2 from the air as subsequent storage in underground reservoirs. So overall, it is not enough to reduce total CO2 emissions to net zero around the middle of this century, but it is also necessary to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. What counts is the balance of emissions and removals but this should be limited to a maximum, the so-called carbon budget. There are different ways to limit total global temperature rise. We will discuss a few scenarios as published in the report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. The IPCC is the main scientific advisory body to the United Nations and all the national governments on climate change. In the report, Global Warming of 1.5 degrees C, they defined four different illustrative pathways for emission reduction. Here, each picture represents a separate pathway, all of which stay within the global carbon budget. At the left, P1, you see a scenario with very rapid reduction of CO2 emissions. As a result, only little CO2 removal is needed later in the century. At the very right, you see a procrastination scenario, P4, in which emission reduction is delayed. This would require huge removals of CO2 later in this century. The other two scenarios are in between. What will the energy system look like in each of these scenarios? This graph shows the breakdown of primary energy use over time. We see that in all scenarios, Energy use is fairly stable over time, at least until 2050, despite expected growth of the population and the global economy. Limitation of energy use is achieved by strongly pursuing energy efficiency in all sectors. Energy efficiency is very important in all mitigation scenarios and can be considered a cornerstone of every mitigation strategy. We can also see the specific contribution of different energy sources. Biomass is an important fuel source, but also the combination of fossil fuels with carbon capture and storage. Carbon capture and storage, abbreviated CCS, means that the CO2 that is generated during combustion is captured, for example from the flue gases. The CO2 is then stored outside the atmosphere, for example in depleted natural gas fields. In this picture, we first zoom in on electricity production. While total energy use is stable, this is not the case for the electricity use. This graph shows the electricity generation in each pathway. We see in all scenarios an increasing role of electricity as an energy carrier. 
How could this electricity be produced? All pathways see an important role for solar and wind energy, depicted here in yellow and blue. These are now the cheapest ways to achieve an electricity system without CO2 emissions. But some other sources can contribute as well, for example nuclear energy, bioenergy and hydropower. Let's now go back to the earlier picture with primary energy use. In this picture, the electricity sector is included. We see the substantial contributions of solar and wind in yellow and blue again. But next to electricity, we also need fuel and heat. How are these produced? In these illustrative scenarios, there are contributions of different energy sources. Biomass is an important fuel source in all scenarios, but we also see a role for the combination of fossil fuels with carbon capture and storage. Carbon capture and storage, abbreviated CCS, means that the CO2 that is generated during combustion is captured, for example, from the flue gases. The CO2 is then stored outside the atmosphere, for example, in depleted natural gas fields. Recently, there is more attention for using hydrogen as a fuel. This can be produced, for example, from renewable energy. As said, these scenarios are illustrative but they very much represent the state of the art in mitigation scenario and I recommend to take a closer look at the material that will also be made available offline. In the next picture, I will try to summarize very schematically what the energy transition will look like. We focus on final energy use, energy as it is delivered to consumers in industry, buildings and transport. In the current system, about 20% of final demand is provided by electricity and 80% by fuels and heat. Two thirds of this electricity production is from fossil fuels. The fossil fuel contribution to providing fuels and heat is even higher, nearly 90%. As a first step in developing a climate neutral energy system, energy efficiency improvement needs to play a central role then it is possible to keep global energy use roughly at the current level, despite a growing population and economic development. A byproduct of this energy efficiency improvement is a shift to electricity. Various efficient technologies are based on, elect on electricity, for example, electric cars and heat pumps. Similar technologies are available for industrial processes. This will lead to a much higher share of electricity in final energy use, from about 20% now to 40 or 50% in the future. The shift to electricity is important, as there are quite some climate neutral energy sources that can supply electricity. The most important ones are solar energy and wind energy. For both energy sources, the costs have rapidly declined over the past years, making a transition away from fossil fuels very affordable. Other energy sources like hydropower and nuclear energy can play a role as well. But despite the electrification, fuels and heat are still needed. There are various options for this sector. In most scenarios, bioenergy plays an important role, alongside fossil fuels with CCS. But there is an increasing interest in hydrogen, and it is likely that there will be a solid role for hydrogen and other new fuels provided, of course, they are produced without CO2 emissions. Also, heat from solar and geothermal resources will contribute. In conclusion, the three critical elements of low carbon energy systems are energy efficiency improvement, a much higher share of electricity in final energy use, and a strong emphasis on renewable energy. To summarize, and also to close this first week, the transition away from fossil fuels with CO2, with CO2 emissions is feasible. Having said that, to achieve a transition like this in just a few decades requires a tremendous effort from everyone and every organization. Are you ready to participate in this transition? Then see you next week.